I've taken a look at various dimmer modules on eBay in the past, and this is one of the smallest and cheapest ones. And I thought, I'll get one, and it will reverse engineer, and we'll compare it to the circuitry in a typical sort of compliant British dimmer. The first thing I'm noticing here is that the uh, this dimmer has an inductor in it. It's got a little toroidal um, choke in there to actually reduce the electrical noise from the switching. So this is the module that is of interest initially. It's described as 220 volt, 3 amp, gold tone table lamp, full range dimmer, rotary switch, two way. Uh, okay, yep, so it came in at £1.3 in this instance, which is buttons really. So let's start by opening this up and then uh, we'll reverse engineer it. So where are my snips? There's my snips. Let's nibble into the plastic here. Technically speaking, I should have demonstrated this in use, but uh, the excitement of uh, a lamp ramping up and down is not going to be that great. Ooh, right. So um, I'm going to have to pull my knob off here, I'm afraid, to get this uh, cover off, this bit of heat shrink sleeving. This is uh, the only insulation on this, by the way. It's kind of designed to mount inside something with just this plastic shaft poking through and then the knob and, on the end of it. Interesting little track. Unusual package, a pH, is that a pH 600E? I'm just going to take a closer look at that. You may be able to see it, I can't. pH 600E uh, and 68 nano capacitor. Okay, interesting. So uh, let's reverse engineer this then. Let's bring the notepad in. This will be fairly textbook. I'm only seeing the potentiometer with just two terminals. I'm seeing the switch connection here. The two wires coming off, and then what I'd call the classic components, a DIAC, and then another resistor in there. Okay. Let's, uh, I'm trying to see actually, and let's take this light. Uh, the colour code of that one is, is that red or brown? Uh, I'll have to measure that one. Okay, let's measure that resistor. It's a bit covered over. So let's make sure this is turned off, because it does have a switch and that will take some of the active circuitry out. And then we can measure that. So that is measuring at 100 ohms, it's a... Uh, so that's a uh, brown, black, yellow then. One zero and another four zeros, so that's 100,000 ohms. Okay. What's the potentiometer while I'm here? I'll do these measurements now and then I don't have to do them afterwards. Let's not put my fingers over the back of that because then that would skew the reading. It's 0.5 mega ohm, it's 500k. Rightio, we have a couple of values. We've got all the values actually we need here. So, the first thing we've got, this is designed to go in series with a lamp. And it will just basically, it uses what's called phase angle control, which if you've got the main sine wave, the track can switch in both halves. If you had it set to, say, the mid position, it will only turn the track on in the middle of the sine wave. This is why they're so noisy, because that's quite a sudden sharp voltage transient. And then uh, the track will stay on for the rest of the uh, half sine wave. And then when it goes through the zero crossing point into the opposite polarity, the track then turns off. That's one of the features of triacs and thyristors. You only need to give them a small trigger pulse and then they'll stay on for the duration of the cycle or until the current through them goes to near zero. They have what's called a holding current. But in this case, uh, it will turn on for that half and then when it gets to the other half of the sine wave, it will then turn on halfway through for that half, and that would be half intensity. Full intensity would be almost the full sine wave, and at the lowest setting, just the point that it usually goes unstable, would be somewhere down here, so it would just be on for a tiny little portion of the sine wave. They are very electrically noisy. The modern ones, uh, the fairly sophisticated ones, do the opposite. They turn on at the beginning of the sine wave, and they turn off uh, mid sine wave, and that's just a, a way of creating much less noise. They don't even require inductors. Uh, that's called the lagging edge because the actual edge, it doesn't matter, it's not drawing a sudden spike of current, it's gradually increasing the current up and then it's just dropping off. So this uh, is going to have one terminal. Have I screwed up already because I should have actually put the switch in that? That's okay, I can still put the switch in it. Uh, so the switch is going to go, so we've got this white wire coming in, white, 
uh, and it's going through the switch for a start. So we'll just draw the switch like that. I'll just cheat and add it in. It's going through the switch. It's going to the triac. It looks like it's going to MT2. It is going to MT2. The triac has three terminals. It has MT2, main terminal 2, main terminal 1, and it has gate. When you're turning the triac on, you have to reference it with reference to MT1. So uh, in this case, it will be getting its power from the MT2 side. But uh, it, if you wanted to turn a triac on manually, so to speak, you could literally connect a battery between MT1 with a suitable resistor and gate, and that would turn it on. I wouldn't actually recommend that, since these are usually referenced to the mains. The output of the track, there's the MT1 there, is just going straight to the other terminal. That also makes sense. So that's the black wire. It doesn't really matter uh, which way around these goes, it's just an AC component. What does the circuitry do now? So that's going through the white, it's going through the switch, it's then going to the resistor. This is all fairly textbook, so that's a 100k resistor. It's then, let's say I zoom in a bit here because I am just kind of concentrating on the pad here, am I? That's going to make it easier for people looking at small phone screens. It's then going to the potentiometer. And the middle of the potentiometer, the wiper of the potentiometer, let's, uh, it's only got two connections on this, so I'll draw it as it is. Uh, goes to the capacitor, which goes to, right, okay, so it's going to this capacitor. I looked at the value for that. I've forgotten the value of it already. It's actually readable. 68 nano. 68 nanofarad. Um, and then the final bit of the puzzle here is the DIAC, which is this little blue component here, and its main function is triggering triacs. It's going straight to the gate of the triac, um, and it's coming from that point of the potentiometer and the capacitor. That is just textbook. So here's the DIAC, and it looks a bit like a triac, but it's only got two terminals. And the point of the DIAC is that usually they have a voltage of, say, about 30 volts. And as soon as that voltage of 30 volts is reached, it will suddenly turn on. So here's the actual way this works. On each half wave, this... Uh, actually, I've just drawn that wrong. I have to draw that down there. There we go. That'll do. Uh, on each half wave, this capacitor starts charging through these resistors. This one will limit the maximum current into it. Um, that will also limit uh, ex the maximum time it's going to charge. So that will also set the... Um, that's the fastest it can charge, so that will also set the sort of minimum intensity. Some of the these units have variable uh, resistors added, so you can actually adjust the upper and lower levels, but this is very simple. This one is a 500k, this potentiometer. So it charges via these resistors, and when it reaches that 30 volt tre threshold, this capacitor then suddenly discharges via this DIAC, which triggers, and into the gate of the triac, which then turns it on, and that shunts uh, this whole circuit, and it turns the light on. And the offset half wave, it's just the, simply the opposite polarity. It all happens again. So this capacitor is alternately charging positive and negative on each half wave. And because the DIAC's also a bi-directional device and the track, it just does roughly the same. There often is a very tiny little difference in the symmetry, but that's more or less it. So that's a, that's very straightforward. Let's see if this is a straightforward. So let's uh, zoom back out again here. I'm going to take this module off completely. These usually come off in a similar way. The knob pulling off the front and then just a bit of hardware holding them in. So let's take this out. Sometimes you get the multiple dimmer plates, which is just a series of these modules next to each other on the long plate. So let's open this up and take a look inside. I reckon it's going to be very similar to the other one, the cheapy one, but maybe... Well, it's going to have that uh, extra suppression circuitry, and that's possibly just going to be the main thing, really. Here we go. Let's see if we can take this off completely. Ooh. 
So there's the track, and the track, to save space, they've really rammed it down onto the board. Here's the inductor. That looks like a thermal fuse. That looks like a suppression capacitor. And they're using very small timing capacitors in the look of it. Where's the other resistors? There must be other limp resistors. And what, what's that other capacitor for? That is, that is odd. That's strange. That's not a, uh, it just looks different. Unless they're using a dedicated component, a dimmer component. Uh, no, that's a BTA06 600B triac. Where's that? Uh, where's my light again so I can just uh, shine light into... I've, I've lost the light. That's quite annoying. There it is. So I can see if that's got anything. Uh, BTA 06600C, which is a very, very common track with an isolated tab usually. Right, one moment. I'm going to have to... Uh, this is going to be a wee bit more complex. I'm going to have to see what's going on here. I wonder if there's something special about this potentiometer that it effectively incorporates other resistors. Uh, one moment, please. Okay, that's it reverse engineered. It's very similar, but what's really interesting is that the potentiometer in here has three resistors built into it, the variable one plus the others. And I'm guessing that if you look into a standard potentiometer, you've got the circular track of carbon that the wiper arm goes around. And normally you've got the three metal tabs come in. One metal tab goes to the middle, and there's a metal ring in there that a wiper arm rides on, and it goes round, it can wipe round that. And then there's just little paths, metal paths down to here. In this case, I think they've extended that out possibly by some sort of zigzag maybe, and a little loop here to give a low value resistor and a high value resistor that the wiper arm can't touch. Part of me says I want to see the inside of this, and that generally means that you'd probably want to see the inside of it too. So after I've gone over the schematic, I'm going to open this potentiometer and we'll take a look at the track and see what it's like. So what we have here, we've got the supply come in just like the other circuit diagram. It's going through the switch, which uh, is good because it effectively kills the uh, output completely. Also, when you've got it completely turned off, it also removes this uh, capacitor from the circuit. Some dimmers actually have the capacitor on the other side, and it's always in line, and they're the ones that can make some LED lamps glow. Uh, that also happens with the fully electronically controlled dimmers where there is no physical switch. Uh, the remote control ones or the Wi-Fi enabled ones where there's always that, there's no switch there so there's always capacitor across, the suppressed capacitor and that leaks enough current to cause problems. It makes some LED lamps flash and some compact fluorescent lamps also flash and some of the simpler LED lamps with just capacitive droppers, they will just glow at a low level continuously with that capacitor. After that, it's got this... Uh, Thermal fuse. The thermal fuse, I'm guessing, uh, is monitoring this inductor for over... I'm guessing that's going to get quite hot if you've got a very high load. So the thermal fuse will just break the whole circuit in the event of uh, that this getting too hot inside. The inductor is just in series with the triac. That does tend to require a snubberless triac, uh, one that can deal with an inductive uh, load in series with it. Uh, that that what you with triacs you sometimes get a, what's called a dv well all tracks you get a dvdt rating change in voltage over time if too high a, a speed spike hits the track it will tr self turn on and some tracks are very sensitive to even the smallest inductive uh, components in series with them so sometimes to get around that they'll have a snubber network in the form of a resistor and a capacitor uh, tacked across it just because that will absorb the sharp transients and it will take that away from the track itself. But in this case, uh, the track seems to be optimised for this. So in the uh, potentiometer, it can't go lower than 29k and the only other thing that's different to the other dimmer is this extra 68 nanofarad capacitor. Both these little tiny capacitors are I would guess they're only rated about 50 volts, but if you keep in mind that uh, it doesn't have to be rated any higher because as soon as this reaches about uh, 30 volts, it will trigger and dump that capacitor through the uh, into the gate of the tr triac. 
So the two resistors in here are the 29K and the 5.3K down there and then a 300K variable section in the middle. And there is this other capacitor here. I'm not sure why. Maybe that just makes it less susceptible to switching glitches and transients. It will. That's probably what it is. It means that uh, you're less likely to get false triggering if this is acti acting as a, a pre-filter. Not come across that before. That's quite interesting. Right, now I need to drill this thing open because it's riveted together. This means goodbye dimmer, but that's okay. Uh, I'm going to pause momentarily. No, I shall not pause. I think we'll just do this while it's running. So let's grab a drill. This drill bit may be too big. Let's uh, choose a smaller drill bit. Let's choose this drill bit. Now let's put this drill bit... Oh no, I'm going to leave that one out because I need it. And I shall just pop this drill in. Try not to close the chuck far too much. And I shall try and drill that out. I may actually zoom out here because this is where I'll need a bit more space. So let's see if we can drill these rivets out. In a controlled manner. They may just do that thing where they spin. Oh, they're not, that's not it's coming out. Oh, that's good. That's what we want to see. So what do we have here? We have a continuously conductive section. Let's uh, zoom down on this a bit. Oh, that's weird. That's slightly different to what I was expecting, in a way. That's far too, that's far too much zoomed to the point of loss of detail. Is that better? Uh, what we have here, we've got the conductive trace that's coming down. There is a sort of uh, straight resistive lead-in look by the look of it, but they've actually got, between the pins, they've actually got another section bridging these two pins. Hold on, I'm just going to measure this with a, a meter. Let's uh, zoom out just a tiny bit because I'm just a little bit too close here. That's quite odd, that strange section there. Is that a... Oh, you know what, that might be... No, I, I'm not 100% sure what that is. Th this is a very odd potentiometer. I've never seen one quite like this before. Let's measure between these two pins here. So that's the 5K I was getting there. Uh, and when it... Uh, what's this here? Is this a... This is a conductive layer by the look of it. Okay, leading into that. So for most of this, it's zero until it gets to here. And then it starts off at, well, that's actually, oh, that's odd. No, that is, that's reason enough. That is a conductive layer up to that point. And then it's got the carbon. So this should be about, that is, that's the 300k section, but then what about here? Why wouldn't it go... I wonder what arc that actually covers in there. Oh, it's not going to, it's not going to show now because I've kind of skewed, screwed it up. Oh, that's all covered in grease as well, that was unexpected. Oh, that's very gooey, sticky grease. Yeah, it's that grease that feels resinous, it's designed to stay put. So there's the wiper contact. I'm just trying to work out what, why it doesn't... Oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. It's a limited arc. That's why it's uh, conductive up to this point. And the arc is limited to a, a fairly small section, so it'll never go any further than there. So um, is there any clue of that? Is there any sign of the... It, there isn't... A, because it's fairly new, it's not got any sign of where it's been rubbing. But um, I'm guessing it stops short of here, so it just can never continue. And that is the 29k section. That's very clever. That I've never come across something like that before. It's very neat. 
uh, another way to actually test that, this is where I have to eat humble pie if it's wrong, is that I would expect then, depending on where the arc finishes, that this might be this a 29k-ish mark. Oh no, I'm completely wrong. Where is 29k then? It must stop before it, it stops round about here. So that's where the arc would go to, and it just doesn't quite reach the end of that track. Neat. Very clever. Very optimised, but it means that potentiometer has been specifically designed for that dimmer. Which makes sense, because it's a mass-produced item, you know, they can basically specify exactly what they want. It saves them those other two resistor components. Um, but that's very odd. Very, very interesting. So yeah, that's the comparison between uh, the two dimmers. The main difference here, really, when it comes to crunch, it's using resistors uh, actually on the circuit board instead of mounted on here. The triax bigger in this one for a higher rating. And the only other notable two components that are that different is it's got, well, three components. It's got the interference suppression capacitor, 47 nano. It's got the thermal cutout for safety, and it's got the inductor to cut down on the radio interference, and that is fundamentally the main difference between the cheapos and the more sort of UK-compliant dimmer modules.